Hey everyone, welcome to the next installment of my Dark Souls Expert Guide series. Uh, if it hasn't become rather obvious at this point, today we're going to talk about parrying. Uh, actually, we're going to talk about parrying and reposting, but since reposting is the easy part, most of what I'll cover today is actually about the parry itself. So I chose to do a parry video, mostly because a lot of the comments I've seen over the course of uh, uploading my videos is a lot of people have said, hey, you're really good at parrying, you should do a video about it. Uh, so then I started doing my expert guide series, and I asked basically, what do you guys want to see? Uh, what what would you like to see me take into more depth and learn about? And uh, parrying came up as the number one answer. So here we are. Uh, I know there's a few videos out there that cover parrying in general. Uh, EWGF has a really good video about PvP parrying. Uh, I think Peef Peverson has a few videos covering specific timing of different weapons. And I know there's a few PvE videos out there. But most of them don't go into very much depth. Uh, and since I know you guys expect me to take it to another level, uh, that's what I'm going to attempt to do today. I won't be covering PvP today. As I've already said, it's been covered. But also because I think before you even attempt to parry in PvP, you really need to have a firm grasp of the mechanics uh, in just regular play. I mean, if you're struggling to do parries on any of the enemies in the game, then you're really going to struggle if you're trying to do it against actual human opponents. I mean, it is a completely different beast, but my thoughts are, if you get really good at the PvE portion, then you basically just need to adjust your timing to compensate for the latency. Uh, that's how I learned. I basically mastered it in PvE first, then I simply went online and started learning the different timings, uh, but essentially it's the same thing. So with that said, uh, let's get on with the video. So basically, there are four conditions that must be met if you want to successfully parry your opponent. Uh, if any of these conditions are not met, then your parry will not work. Uh, the first condition is that you must be using an item in your left hand that is able to parry. Meaning whatever you're using has to have a parry animation or you have no chance to parry. Uh, this generally means small shields, medium shields, daggers, katanas, curved swords, thrusting swords, and fist weapons including your fist. And as always, there are usually exceptions. Uh, there are a few shields that have special animations uh, that cannot parry. Uh, spike shield, piercing shield, and crystal ring shield all come to mind. When you hit the left trigger, you won't get a parry animation, but something else. Obviously, these will not work. The second condition is that your opponent must be parryable. Essentially, this means any humanoid with a weapon that is your size or one size larger. Uh, by one size larger, I mean things like black knights, silver knights, uh, Gwen, etc. Larger enemies like the Giants in Anor Londo and most bosses, as well as anything not a humanoid like a rat or something of that nature, cannot be parried. I would say, as a general rule, if your opponent is humanoid, is close to your size, is attacking you with a weapon, and you can backstab him, then you can probably parry him. Now the only caveat to this is fighting against other players in PvP. Certain jumping attacks with weapons cannot be parried, but everything else is fair game. The third condition is that you must be close enough to your opponent to parry them. This is a little deceiving because a lot of people try to judge their distance based on the opponent's weapon. Unfortunately, the game does not work this way. The game does not care if your opponent has a dagger or a halberd. The game decides whether or not you can parry that opponent based on your proximity to them. The closer, the better. Basically, the rule I use is if you're close enough to parry their fist, you're close enough to parry anything that they have in their hand. The fourth and most difficult condition is that you must time your parry to coincide with your opponent's attack. During your parry animation, there are only a few short frames where your parry is actually active. This is what's called a parry window. Now weapons have a similar window, in that during the entire animation of your weapon swing, there is only a few short frames where the weapon becomes active. So essentially, your parry window must be active at the moment your opponent's weapon attack window is active to succeed in your parry attempt. If you're too early or too late, you will simply get hit as normal. If you're just a little bit too early, you might perform something called a partial parry, which is something that I'll cover a little bit later in the video. I will also go into more specifics on parry windows and recovery times for each of the different items you can parry with. For now, just know that the beginning of the parry animation is the active part, and the end of it is the recovery time. Therefore, in general, it's always better to go just a little bit early than it is to try to go late. So now that we cover the basics, let's take a look at a couple parries at full speed followed by slow motion. The full speed is very difficult to tell the parry window because it happens too quickly. In the slow motion though, things become a lot more apparent. 
Pay close attention to the exact moment of my enemy's attack animation that I begin my parry. Also notice that the opponent has already been parried long before my arm swings out to the left. This illustrates exactly what I was saying about how the beginning of the parry animation is the active part and what happens afterwards is only the recovery animation. This clip alone can offer you more information than everything I've said up to this point. So earlier I had mentioned that if you start your parry just a few frames too early, you end up with something called a partial parry. Essentially what that is is like a pseudo parry or a pseudo block. You don't actually parry the opponent, but you also don't suffer the full brunt of their attack. Now you do still take some damage, but I would estimate about a 70% reduction. The important part, however, is that you suffer no blocks done, no poise damage, no knockback, no knockdown, or anything of the sort. Now the coolest part about all this is that it works on any attack in the game unlike a normal parry. Therefore you can parry creatures, magic, arrows, or even bosses. It even affects the status buildup from things like poison, bleed, and toxic. Having said all that, unfortunately it's just not very useful in normal gameplay. Anytime you could pull off a partial parry, you probably would have been better served by simply blocking or dodging the attack. So other than a few select moments in the game, it's not actually very useful. It's better than getting hit, but it's not the best option. So once you've successfully parried your opponent, it's time to repost. Now this section is going to be fairly short because there really isn't a lot to talk about, but I do want to cover a few things to be thorough. First of all, if you can parry it, you can almost always repost it. The only exception that I know of is the heavy mace knights that you find in Sin's Fortress and the Parish. I believe they're the Baranike Knights or Baranike. I'm not sure how to say it, but that was my best guess. Just like with a parry, a repost has to be performed close enough to your enemy for it to trigger. Now, if you're too far away and you hit your button, it's actually only going to come out as a normal attack. Uh, if you want to be safe, you can always step forward after the uh, parry. Uh, you have about a full second. So you have plenty of time to either step forward, swap weapons, switch from one hand to two hand, or even swing around and backstab the opponent. You can perform a repose with almost all weapons, but there are a few that you can't. Uh, this includes whips, catalysts, pyro gloves, and talismans. Every other weapon that I'm aware of will perform a repose, even your fists. Another thing to mention is that a repose can only be performed when you're on equal footing to your opponent. If you are below or above them due to stairways, uh, uneven ground, or something like that, it will not work. Often the parry will work, but the repose will only come out as a regular attack. This seems to be true for the rotating elevator in Anor Orlando and a few other spots in the game. The last thing to talk about is damage. Repose do a massive damage to your opponent, but it can be done higher with certain weapons or by using certain items. Daggers and thrusting weapons have modifiers that increase the damage they do during a critical attack. This number is listed with the other weapon statistics in the item menu. There is also a hidden modifier that isn't shown anywhere. While it may seem by the numbers that the daggers have the highest critical modifier, the rapier actually has the highest. If you want to boost your damage even higher, then you're going to be interested in the Hornet's Ring. This ring increases critical damage by 50% and it works with both repost and backstabs. It also gives a special animation for both of these attacks. Now keep in mind that there are quite a few people who look down upon the use of this ring in PvP, so you can use it at your own discretion. However, I don't see any shame in using it during a normal playthrough. So I've already explained what the parrying window is, and now I'm going to show you just how long that window is for each unique group of weapons and shields. Before I show you the numbers, I'll explain how I calculated them. If you haven't noticed before, when you do a parry animation near a wall, it will create a spark. This represents the first frame of the parry animation. When you do it on a wall in a moving elevator, however, you get multiple sparks. So the number of frames between the first and last spark represents the entire parry window. The time between the final spark and the next parry represents the recovery time. I did this with each different item and then counted the frames using Sony Vegas. Here's how the frames are counted. Dark Souls runs at 30 frames per second, and there are 1000 milliseconds in each second. Therefore, each frame is approximately 33 milliseconds. As a reference, a human eye can blink as fast as 3 to 400 milliseconds, so at least you'll have an idea of just how small or large these windows are. Now this method is somewhat rudimentary, but until the PC version comes out and people are able to data mine, this is the best we can do. The numbers, however, were very consistent, and so the relative difference between the different groups is 100% accurate. The only thing I'm not sure of is if the parry window extends a frame or two beyond the final spark. So the absolute number I'm giving you is a conservative value, and the parry window may indeed be a frame or two longer. 
However, as I said, the relative difference between the groups is still relevant. Also note that only metal shields and weapons create a spark, so most of the small shields weren't able to be tested. However, in all other cases, each item within its group was identical to one another, so I believe it's safe to assume that all small shields, besides the special shields, will have the same parry window and recovery time. So with all that in mind, let's look at the numbers. So first up we have the special group. This consists of the parrying dagger, target shield, and buckler. The total parry window for this group was 8 frames or approximately 260 milliseconds. The recovery took 19 frames or 630 milliseconds. That means the entire parry animation lasts 27 frames or 890 milliseconds, which just happens to be the longest in the game. So while this group has the most lenient parry window time-wise, it also takes the longest to complete and be ready for the next parry. So for the rest of the groups, I'm going to let you guys watch in peace so that I don't have to say millisecond 50 more times. So as you just saw, all but the special group had the exact same parry window. However, their recovery and total animation time was different. Curved swords have a very long recovery time, even longer than their special group. However, their total animation was shorter due to the smaller parry window. Daggers, katanas, and fist weapons all had the exact same times and not surprisingly the same exact parry animation itself. The small shields had both the smallest recovery time as well as the total animation time, while the thrusting swords were only one frame behind in recovery. Medium shields were disappointingly slow in comparison, but considering how short these actual time frames are, it's not really that big of a deal. Based on the numbers, it's safe to say that people that are just learning how to parry should probably use one of the items from the special group. The extra parry frames will make it easier to get that initial timing down, and then once you get a bit used to it, you can move to one of the other weapons or shields. Experienced players will likely want to use one of the faster shields or weapons, as they will give you a faster recovery and less chance to be punished in PvP if you miss. For general gameplay purposes, it doesn't really matter what you end up pairing with due to the fact that the recovery time doesn't matter if you successfully parry the opponent. It only really matters if you miss. So that just about wraps up this video. I've covered as much about pairing as I could, so hope you guys get some use out of the video. New players will undoubtedly be able to use the information, but even veteran players can probably put the frame counts to use. The PC release is right around the corner, so stay tuned for more videos. So until next time.